Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the first reading for Palm Sunday from the Old Testament prophet Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, can you imagine how difficult it must be for Jimmy Fallon to try and do the Tonight Show from his own home without any audience? The jokes in his opening monologue often fall flat without the reaction of a live audience. Or can you imagine how difficult it would be for a Major League Baseball team to try and play a game without any fans present? It would be really hard to put your all into the game with no fans yelling and cheering. Can you imagine Palm Sunday without the crowds waving their palm branches and shouting their hosannas? Wouldn't it be much of a welcome for Jesus, would it, if the crowds were silent? But it was far from a silent welcome. There were, in fact, three crowds that first Palm Sunday. There was a crowd that were preparing the way for Jesus, the crowd that followed him, and another crowd that came out from Jerusalem to welcome him. Many went to see him because they'd heard how he had recently raised Lazarus from the dead. Luke tells us the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. In these verses from the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, we hear how Jesus would enter Jerusalem about 500 years later. We hear how he would come as a king. We learn the way in which he would come, and we learn the blessings that he would bring. The noisy welcome that the crowds gave Jesus on that first Palm Sunday were clearly foretold by this Old Testament prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. Those words, daughter Jerusalem and daughter Zion, were God's terms of love and endearment for his people. And his people were to rejoice and shout for joy as they welcomed the Savior. Literally, they were to shout and to jump for joy. It was indeed a royal welcome that the people gave Jesus. They welcomed him as their king. Many of them may have had wrong ideas about what kind of king Jesus would be, but they gave him the royal treatment. They took branches from the palm trees and waved them as they welcomed Jesus. They went out to meet him. Some have said that those palm branches were often used back in the Old Testament at the coronation of Israel's kings. The people also took off their cloaks and spread them on the road. They added palm branches along the way and so they prepared a carpet for Jesus to ride on. What's interesting is the kind of animal that Jesus chooses to ride on. Most kings didn't enter a city riding a donkey. Yet the prophet says, See, your king's come, king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This highly unusual prophecy was fulfilled on Palm Sunday. It was fulfilled in Jesus and in him alone. Jesus had probably spent Saturday night with his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus in Bethany. A dinner had been given in his honor at the home of Simon the leper. That was where Mary anointed his feet with that expensive perfume. And then the next day, on Sunday, Jesus and his disciples set out for Jerusalem, only a couple miles away. On the way, they approached this small village of Bethphage. And Jesus sends two of his disciples to go and, and get the animal that he's going to ride. He gives them very specific instructions right down to how they should handle any objections uh, that people may have when they start to take the animals. And everything turns out exactly as Jesus had foretold. So the disciples bring this donkey and its colt. The disciples put their cloaks on both of the animals, but Jesus chooses the colt as the one that he will ride on. It was a young animal that no one had ever ridden on. 
the first rider would be the savior of the world. And Jesus chooses to ride on a donkey, an animal that was usually used to carry firewood or sacks of grain. He chooses to ride an animal that was usually used to carry heavy loads, and not royalty. Kings usually entered cities on magnificent horses. A king would ride the finest animal available. It was part of the pomp and the pageantry of a king coming into a city. But Jesus doesn't come as an earthly king. He doesn't come with earthly power or might. He comes humbly. He comes gently. He comes riding a lowly donkey, as the prophet foretold. For Jesus had come in peace. He hadn't come to Jerusalem to start a revolution. He didn't arrive in the city to start a rebellion against the Romans who had occupied the land. He had no soldiers with him. He had no weapons to fight with. He wasn't going to start a war. He was no danger to the Romans. He came in peace. For Jesus came to be a spiritual king. He didn't come to be an earthly king. He didn't come to rule over an earthly kingdom. He told Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. He came as a spiritual king to rule in people's hearts and people's lives. And so he still comes to us today. He wants to be our king. He wants to rule in our hearts and in our lives. He wants to be our Lord. He wants to be our master. He wants to be number one in our hearts. And still today he comes peacefully. Jesus doesn't force himself on anyone. He doesn't want anyone to believe in him because he's been forced to. He doesn't want to rule as king in someone's life because they've been pressured or coerced. He works quietly. He works gently through the means of grace, through the gospel, works quietly and gently through word and sacrament, without a lot of fuss or fanfare. Still today, he enters our hearts peacefully, just as he entered the city of Jerusalem peacefully 2,000 years ago. But why did Jesus come to Jerusalem? What was his purpose? What was his mission? We remember that this was the beginning of Holy Week. This was the week that would culminate in his suffering and death on the cross. The crowds that here cheer Jesus by Good Friday would be turning on him and screaming for his crucifixion. For many weeks, Jesus had been predicting his suffering, death, and resurrection. A number of times he clearly said, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. He'd resolutely gone to Jerusalem, knowing full well what lay ahead for him. He went to Jerusalem to suffer and die because he wanted to, because of his great love for us. He once said, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And Jesus knew the purpose of his suffering and death. He knew that he'd come to Jerusalem to suffer and die for the sins of the world. He said he'd come to seek and to save the lost. He said that his blood would be shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said that he'd come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What an unusual king entered Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday. Jesus didn't come as a king to be waited on hand and foot by his servants. He came not to have others serve him, but to serve others. Unlike earthly kings, he came as a servant king. He came to give his life to save the world from sin. He came to defeat the power of sin, death and the devil. He came to win the victory over the forces of evil. And that's why Zechariah writes here, 500 years earlier, See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious. The Old Testament prophet knew that the coming Messiah would be righteous, that he would be holy, that he would be the perfect sinless Savior. He also knew that he would be victorious, that God would deliver him from all his afflictions and finally give him the final victory. That's why Jesus not only entered Jerusalem in peace, but he also came to bring peace. He came to create peace. But it would not be an earthly peace. It wouldn't be a peace between people. 
Jesus once said, Don't suppose I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. And it wouldn't be a peace between nations. Jesus said there would be wars and wars until the end of time. For Jesus came not to bring an earthly peace, but a spiritual peace. He came to bring peace between us and God. He came to Jerusalem to bring a spiritual peace. Peace between us sinful people and our holy God. He came to Jerusalem to restore us, to reconcile us to God. He came so that we might have fellowship with God, that we may have life with God, both now and forever in heaven. Speaking of Jesus, God says through the prophet, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. With this poetic language, God is foretelling the peace that Jesus would bring between us sinful people and himself, like a time of peace when no weapons would be needed. There would be an end to the hostilities between us and God because of our sin. There would be only everlasting peace. And that is a peace that we desperately need. By nature, we're not at peace with God. Far from it. Paul writes to the Romans, the sinful mind is hostile to God. By nature, people are not good. By nature, people are not spiritually neutral, capable of good or evil. By nature, we are hostile to God, opposed to God, antagonistic towards God. And by nature, we are under his eternal wrath and condemnation. There is no peace by nature between us and God. But God, Jesus came to make peace between us and God. He came to Jerusalem to reconcile sinful people with their holy God. By his suffering and death on the cross, Jesus broke down that wall, that barrier of sin that separated us from God. And so on that first Palm Sunday, he not only came in peace, but he came to bring peace. And Jesus did this for everyone in the whole world. He did it for people of all nations. Zechariah says here that the coming Savior will proclaim peace to the nations. Jesus didn't just pay for the sins of some people in certain countries and not in others. He came to pay for the sins of all the people of the world. Paul writes, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world so the whole world could benefit from this peace that Jesus brought. This is the peace that the angels spoke of over the fields of Bethlehem at that first Christmas. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Not peace between people, not peace among people, but peace to people. This is why Isaiah calls the coming Savior the Prince of Peace and says of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Jesus will reign as king in the hearts and lives of his people around the world. Zechariah says that his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The Savior's rule would extend from the river Euphrates and around the world. He will be King of kings and Lord of lords for his believers all over the earth. This prophecy of Zechariah was meant to give hope. It was meant to give hope to God's people in the midst of their afflictions. And these verses did give encouragement and comfort to the people of Judah after they returned from the Babylonian captivity. For they were once again harassed by their enemies. Once again, they were plagued by spiritual apathy and indifference. Zechariah here lifts their eyes away from the problems of the present world. Have them look at the Savior and his work, his life, and the peace that he would bring them. Even if this Palm Sunday isn't very festive for us, it can still be filled with joy. These verses of Zechariah can also lift our eyes away from the problems of this present world and focus them on Jesus and his life and his work and the peace that he came to bring. In the midst of our afflictions, we know we have the greatest blessing of all. We have peace with God now 
and for all eternity. May you always know that peace. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. And we pray. Lord God, we humbly come before you at this time of crisis here in our nation and around the world. According to your will, stem the tide of the coronavirus pandemic. And when your time is right, deliver us from this calamity. Protect those caring for the sick and dying. Grant recovery to those who are ill. Be with our leaders and grant them the wisdom to make the right decisions for the good of our nation. Give us patience and endurance that we may humbly submit to your will and learn the lessons you would teach us. Help us to find good in the midst of tragedy and your love in the midst of trouble. We thank you that Professor Mark Zarling, president of Martin Luther College, has been able to return home from hospital and is recovering from the coronavirus. We also give you thanks that our eighth grade teacher, Jake Shabel, has returned the call to Minnesota and will continue to teach in our school. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a reminder that if you would like private communion, contact one of us pastors and we'll be happy to do that for you.